to the university, the students, friends, fellow professors, and research and teaching the IOP. Phil was particularly fond of subject of leadership. I remember him with emotion one of his quotes from an ancient wisdom when I once asked him to advise on a personal leadership question regarding my career in the answer. Leadership is like crossing and a piece upon a south stream. Uniformly, completely. His answer always says, he remained with me and with me. Thank you, Bill. Bill was also fond of Jim Cousins, <coughs> deeply grounded research that he described as theoretical and applicable, passionate and tangible. Herb lectured much, lectured much about it. I have in mind the time period when at the end of the 80s, when I was doing my PhD, I can imagine how proud he was enthusiastic, uh, how proud and enthusiastic Herb would be to see Jim himself. Uh, in my role as a leadership coach for executives for different cultures, the subject of leadership was and is always will remain of keen interest to me. It is a field with no easy answers, where we continually face new dimensions, uh, the need for research, study, and reflection. It is a privilege to be listening to such a renowned and experienced speaker as Jim Cousins and a special insight on what is true about leadership. Thank you, John, Margie, Bob, for hosting this lecture series again, Christina Isabella. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jimmy Sherbano, who will introduce our speaker. Great. on me giving a long introduction so you can get some stuff out of the street. <laughs> um, uh, it's really my pleasure um, to be in the very long term, and you'll come back to the day because it's really a pleasure. It's always an honor. I'm really proud of you. I'm going to find that Jim is one of the most incredible speakers, executive and management background first and then lead into the kinds of things we've done particularly as an author and educator. Um, I'll have to excuse my eyes but I have to get them stitched up on either side and so they're blurry. So I'm happy to see why. He, uh, and in terms of his executive experience, he uh, was the president and then the CEO of the chairman of Tom Peters company um, 1988 till 2000. And that was quite an exciting time for him, I know, and certainly a challenging time as well. Uh, he also, as part to that, was the director of the Executive Development Center at Santa Clara University uh, from 1981 to 1987. And he founded, and I worked with him on this one, the uh, Joint uh, Center for Human Services Development at San Jose State University which he directed from 72 until uh, 1980. Um, that was really fun because we were doing some work with them and that's where I first got so thoroughly impressed with his ability to speak and express himself. He just never loses it. But don't try to be like <laughs> um, Anyway, the other the one I wanted to mention before I say just a few words about his book, which I want to show you, it's uh, both in hard and it's uh, a leader's legacy by Barry Posner and Jim Kuzis and the leadership challenge. I'm going to be happy to see some of these paperbacks. So. Um, but one of the things Jim was doing back in the um, 80s and was developing a leadership um, inventory. And it turned out to be, that was the old days. That was when we all used 
who has made copies of the CDs of the group and stuff. It was wonderful. Now, of course, it's uh, on the shelf and costs a whole lot of money. <laughs> we do live in a capitalist society. Yes. And one of the things about it, too, is that it's very well done, and I guess when we had to pay for it, we were, you know, I was working in the Postal Service, and uh, their labor executive. And it was, again, extremely effective. So he was brilliant from the beginning of developing it, always backed it up with tons of research, and it's a wonderful instrument. So I can highly recommend that to you. Um, and it is, it, that was back when it was a 380 degree, but if you said no, it was not new. Um, and over 500,000 leaders and 3 million observers have completed the LPI. It is a top selling, off the shelf leadership assessment instrument in the world, and it's been called the most reliable, up to date leadership instrument in the world today. And it really is fantastic. So for those of you that are particularly working with leaders and doing coaching, I would say, I'll do the marketing side of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, they, um, the other exciting thing is he's a very prolific writer. He and Barry uh, Sosner have both uh, produced about 30 publications and included that was the, I have to go after him, was the first edition, because I remember that. Um, of the, the fourth edition of the Leadership Challenge uh, was just printed in 2007. Uh, the original was 87. And I know it gets better and better, but it's fantastic from the beginning. I probably got the old book. Uh, <coughs> anyway, so that, that book has won the words from the first place. We're not going to try to go into everything. Uh, but one of, one of them includes um, Amazon as one of the best books. And uh, 800 CEO Reed um, did it as one of the 100 best business books of all time. Not just a year, but of all time. He's also written uh, Credibility, How Leaders Gain and Lose It, Why People Demand It, Encouraging the Heart, The Leadership Challenge Workbook, and again, 30 other uh, publications. Um, we've also read the Encouraging the Heart Workbook which is pretty neat too. I mean, hope you say a few words about some of the uh, categories in there that are different from most. Um, the only other thing was a couple of things I was going to mention that they had won the International Management Council, IMC, um, as a recipient of the prestigious Wilbur M. McFeely Award for the outstanding contributions to management and leadership education. And among those um, who have received that award are Tom Peters, Ken Blanchard, Norman Vincent Peel, Francis Tesselbaum, David Covey, and Rosabeth Moss Cantor. So it really was something that was um, a real honor and certainly belongs right up there with him. He also was awarded, presented the uh, Golden Gavel, a highest honor awarded by Toastmasters International. <coughs> You'll also find out why. Uh, so, what he said was um, about himself in terms of his background was that uh, when he thought, when he first knew that he wanted to go into leadership, he was in the Eagle Scouts. And he said that's the day, he, the particular day, he said, January 20th, 1961, when he was inspired to dedicate himself to leadership. That was the day he was one of only a dozen Eagle Scouts who served in John F. Kennedy's honor guard at the presidential inauguration. So that's pretty exciting, and, and you've come a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. She's left out many embarrassing stories. That they, I see that little twinkle in her eye about what I could tell this group. Celebrating my 40th birthday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here, and I know my co-author Barry Posner was here last year. And so, how many of you uh, heard Barry? So, some of you know, you know Barry in a sense of humor, and if he were here, he's not. He's in Tasmania right now. Uh, he's on sabbatical for the year. He was 12 years as dean of the Business School at Santa Clara University, and uh, at the end of his 12th year, he decided 12 years was enough. You, after raising 43 million dollars to build a new business school building at Santa Clara University, he took a sabbatical and uh, turned that job over to someone else. But if he were here, he'd add 
to Jeannie's very gracious introduction that uh, Jim Kuzis is a model speaker. Now those of you who heard Barry last year know his humor, right? And uh, I thought the first time he said that he was actually being serious. <laughs> but it turns out that I didn't know him all that well then. And I thanked him very profusely uh, af after the talk for that introduction. He said, uh, Jim, I know you like to look up words. So before you get carried away with yourself, when you get home <laughs> to that 20 volume Oxford English dictionary that you have on your shelf, look up the word model. So I did. You know what it says? It says noun. A small replica of the real thing. <laughs> so that, 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 that's my co-author. We've been writing, as Jeannie indicated, for, uh, well, since 1981 was when we met. We've been writing since 1982. Uh, the 25th anniversary of the first edition of the Leadership Challenge is uh, 2012. So uh, look, at, look for a big party in 2012. It's been a great uh, adventure. And one of the things we decided to do, because people keep asking us, what's new? What's next? Uh, what are you finding today? And you know, how is it different? We started to investigate that question, particularly as it relates to millennials. And you and I were talking, Kopitsi, about that earlier. Uh, how is it different? So we, we, we looked into the question and we found something quite amazing. There's nothing really new. When you, when you look at the research on leadership, at least over the last 30 years, because that's how long we have been doing the research, you don't find all that much new. The context is new, but not necessarily the practices and the principles. So what we decided to do is instead of write a book about what's new, dedicated to the millennials generation, Gen Y, and what kind of leadership practices might be more appropriate for that generation, we decided to write a different kind of a book. And I was um, having a conversation with, this is not on, that's why it's not advancing, Ken Blanchard and a few other colleagues uh, at, a con at, a, at a group called the Instructional Systems Association, Ken Blanchard, uh, is also a San Diego area resident, was on the panel and I was on the panel, Dale Connor on the panel, uh, a couple of other colleagues in, our, uh, in this field. And uh, in response to a question, I started to say something like, now I don't know what you call something that's been true for 25 years, but, and before I could finish my sentence, Ken interrupted. And he said, I'd call it the truth. <laughs> and so that, that moment always remained in my mind as we were working on this project. So we decided to call the new book The Truth About Leadership. And what I'd like to do is share with you five, because we don't have time for the ten that are in the book, five of those that I think might be a particularly appropriate for this particular venue. And then to tell you also at the end the secret to success in life. That's an added bonus. So, uh, but it comes at the very end, so if you have to leave early, <laughs> you'll have to ask someone else. Uh, which also reminds me that I think we will make copies of the slides available to you post-presentation, so uh, you will be able to, to, to get copies of this. Let's talk about the... This is not necessarily the first truth that we discuss in the new book, but it is one of the five I'm going to share with you. And many of you who are familiar with our work, particularly our book credibility, would not be surprised at this one. And so I just wanted to update you on credibility as the foundation of leadership. Those of you who know our work know that we, we ask people, what do you look for to admire in a leader, someone whose direction you would willingly follow? And uh, we used a questionnaire, a 20-item questionnaire. It had 20 items, starting with ambitious, ending with supportive, and each one had some uh, synonyms that went with it and people were asked to select 7 of 20. So you might take a quick look at this list if you haven't before and, and uh, what do you guess is going to be say in the top 4? What, what's going to come out on top? Confidence. So confidence is going to come out on top. What else? Honest. Honest. Inspiring. Inspiring. Supportive. Supportive. Caring. Caring. Courageous. Courageous. Fair. 
fair. We could go through the whole list then, because <laughs> one of the things one of the things it demonstrates is everyone got every one of these qualities got some votes. So they're important. They're all important. They were nominated for that reason. They were all important. But some ended up being more important than others. When forced to make a choice, you and I have consistently, over the time we've been doing this, now over 25 years, selected a few that come out on top of the list. And here are the results. These are the most current results from 2009. So if you've seen the list previously, these are the most current, current, most current data. So just scan down this list with me, if you will, and if you can see this. We'll kind of say out loud the ones in the top four. So what's the first one on the list that gets 51% or more of the votes in alphabetical, or, in alphabetical order? <laughs> Since the list is in alpha order, on the left-hand column, go down the column. What's the first one? Competent, Competent with 64%. The next one? Forward-looking with 70%. The next one? Honest with 85%. The next one? Inspiring with 69%. And you'll notice that those are the only four that get 51% or more of the votes. Now, there are a few others that are close, 42% for intelligent, 40% for broad-minded, and then supportive, 36 So there are, you know, a few in the top seven, but there are only four that get 51% or more of the vote. Now, this is really, any of you who do research, I've been doing research for 25 plus years, know that it has to be pretty surprising that these four are the only four that have survived as the top four for that long. So while lots of things have changed, we've had recession, more than one recession since we started this. This is the third one, third recession, and the longest and the worst. We've had wars. We've had the introduction of the global economy. We've had 2.0 in technology, Web 2.0, we had Web 2.1, we had no Web, Web 2.0, then 2.0. We had lots of changes, but yet these have survived is what people look for and admire in a leader, someone whose direction they would willingly follow. Now that's useful by itself, this list on the left-hand side. These are in the order in which they currently, uh, from top to bottom. But it also means something else. If you, do, if you look at the research on source credibility, any of you studying communications now, for example, probably run across something called source credibility, which is why people believe other people when they speak mm -hmm. or when they broadcast the news or when they're offering you advice as a coach or a consultant. There's a, there's a believability factor. People won't believe you unless you have certain qualities, it turns out. And the first one on the list is called trustworthiness. The second one on the list is called expertise, and the third one on the list is referred to as dynamism. Now what Barry and I discovered when we first started doing this was there looked to be a lot of similarity between the ones on the right-hand side and the ones on the left-hand side. For honest, you can say trustworthiness. For competent, you can say expertise. And for inspiring, you can say dynamic or dynamism. And so we took this to other researchers in particular, Charles O'Reilly was doing research on credibility, executive credibility. We showed him our results and we asked him what he saw and he confirmed what we saw, which is that basically and fundamentally what people look for and admire in a leader is personal credibility. If you don't believe in the messenger, you won't believe the message. Fundamental truth. Fundamental truth that has lasted for 30 years is going to last, I predict, for another 30 years. I hope to be around that long to come back and collect on my bet that it will. <laughs> so there are, f th th this foundation of personal credibility is the first truth we want to begin with. The second one is this. If you go back to the list for a second, <coughs> and you look at the list on the left, honest, forward-looking, competent, and inspiring, three make up what's called source credibility. What's the other one that's not on the right side of the column? The right side of the slide. Forward looking. What differentiates leaders from other credible people is a focus on the future. Being forward looking. Being forward looking sets leaders apart. Focusing on the future sets leaders apart. We don't necessarily expect a consultant or a coach 
who's in the moment with us giving us advice on how to improve right then and there to be forward looking. We don't expect necessarily a newscaster to be forward looking. We expect them to be credible but we don't necessarily expect them to be forward looking. But we do expect leaders to be forward looking. So the quality that differentiates leaders from other credible people ends up being the quality called forward looking or focusing on the future or having a vision of the future or a long term sense of direction. Now this was confirmed in some data we collected. We asked people to uh, tell us, let's imagine that uh, a new leader, your new leader walked into this room right now introduced him or herself and said, Hi, I'm new, you're, you're your new leader. What would you want to ask this person? What immediately pops to mind? One of the questions is, where are you leading us? Where are you going? The first question people most want to ask a leader is, who are you? That relates to the whole notion of personal credibility. Who are you? What's your background? What are your competencies? What are your values and beliefs? But the next thing that people want to ask is where are we going? The second most frequently asked question is where are we headed? And then somewhere down the list about three or four is what's going to happen to me? What are your plans for me in this future direction based on your values and beliefs? And what's going to happen to me? Now, as future leaders, as present leaders, as coaches, consultants, advisors, teachers, and educators, these are really fundamental things we need to keep in mind. Credibility is the foundation of leadership, and people want to know about leaders. Who are you? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? And they want to know what's, where are you headed? What's, your, what's the direction in which you're taking? What's your vision for the future? And how does that touch me? How does that relate to me? Just to give you a sense of how important it is, Nancy Zimfer, president of the University of Cincinnati, said that vision trumps everything. And when it comes to leadership, in fact, it does. Because again, if you take a look at the data, in leaders, 70% of people say that that's what they look for and admire, so nearly three quarters of us. But if you ask them, what do you look for and admire in a colleague, we took the same list of 20 items, we asked people to, to select the 20 they most looked for in a colleague, someone they'd like to have as a member of their team, and only 27% said they wanted to have it in a colleague. That difference of 43% is the largest difference between colleagues and leaders in our data. It is the factor which most differentiates someone who you would want to follow from someone you would want to have on your team. We want an honest team member. We want a competent team member. We don't necessarily we want a team member who's forward looking. But we want a leader who is forward looking. And if you ask it about senior managers, middle managers, and frontline, as well as students, you'll see that 88% of senior executives say they want someone who is forward-looking as a leader. 70% of middle-level managers, uh, excuse me, about 68% of middle-level managers. And students, 44%, say they want a leader who is forward-looking. What this suggests is that there is both a level of maturity, years of experience, and level that's associated with this notion of being forward-looking. Turns out that students are much more present oriented. You're concerned about the grade you're going to get on the next test. Right? Pretty much. Am I going to graduate? Then it's what am I going to what kind of job am I going to get if you're not already employed? It's only when you get into a leadership role that we see that more than 50% of people expect a leader to be forward-looking. Now, I share this with you because those of you who are students in the fields of management, international studies, IO psych, it's really important to have this information now. To know that what will be expected if you want to move into a leadership role inside an organization is that you have a long-term orientation. You will have a leg up 
if you start now to think 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. What are the future trends in, in uh, the political, I mean, economics, social, technological, that are going to be impacting you in the work that you do and the people you work with and what are the implications of those for how we'll work, the kind of work we'll be doing, for our customers, for the people we work with, for our communities, for the global community, what are the implications? I strongly urge all of you to engage more frequently than you currently engage in dialogue about the future and what it will be like because it is the differentiating factor. And Michael Hyatt comments about vision. Michael Hyatt is the publisher of, uh, is the CEO of a publishing company called Thomas Nelson. That, uh, you know, leadership is really more than influence. It really is about giving people meaning. So it's not just about your vision of the future, but we have found, in fact, that uh, those leaders who have the notion that my job is to go up to climb to the top of the mountain, get inspired, come down and announce to people the direction in which we're headed, are not as likely to be followed as those who say, I have listened to you, and here is what I hear you saying you want. Those leaders end up being more effective, which suggests that it's not just telling or envisioning something that's important, but also listening to others and what their hopes, dreams, and aspirations are. So, inspiring a shared vision is just not about being a charismatic speaker, being somebody who can give a great speech. It is also about being a very good listener. And when we take a look at our leadership practices inventory that Jeannie mentioned, we find that the lowest scoring items, the lowest scoring practice of the five practices is, is inspire a shared vision. And of the six items that measure inspire a shared vision, the three that score the lowest are those that have to do with communicating to other people hopes, dreams, and aspirations in such a way that people can see themselves in the picture. So another skill set that leaders need to develop is the ability not just to see long term to understand the implications of changes in technology and politics and in economics but also to be able to communicate to other people how that will impact them and how their hopes, dreams and aspirations can be met while working towards this vision of the future. The third truth is this one that challenges the crucible of leadership. Challenge is an opportunity. And one of the things we did in our uh, research, those of you who have read the Leadership Challenge who know this, that the, the, fun, the, the basic way we started was we asked, we just asked people a question. We said, tell us, you know, tell us about a time when you did your best as a leader. Write a story about it. And we had very few questions initially. Now we, now we have a lot of questions to get people to elaborate more on this story. But think about a time when you did your best as a leader. Think about a time when you, you would say, well, that was my personal best leadership experience. By the way, we've asked this of people as young as eight years old. And they can tell us stories. And if you were to answer that question, my guess is that it would, well, it, it, it may not mirror exactly these stories, but it would be something that have to do with some kind of challenge, change, difficulty, adversity. Arlene Blum, first woman to lead a team of all women to the, to the top of Annapurna. Women were told at the time that she got a group of all women to climb the 11th highest mountain in the world, that women could not climb mountains that tall as a team. It, it was a man's job. Of course, women didn't know how to work together. They weren't strong enough. They, weren't, they didn't have enough stamina to do that. Well, Arlene set out to challenge that preconception and got a group of women to go on an ascent of Annapurna. Their t-shirt, by the way, for which they used for fundraising, read... A woman's place is on top. (laughs) 
I think you can still buy these t-shirts if you <laughs> Or Carolyn Bourne, who uh, worked in Los Angeles on uh, one of the largest studies of women's health ever conducted in the United States. Jacqueline Martens, who had to restore a losing operation of Intuit uh, to profitability. We have people like uh, Alan Keith, who was told you have two years to turn this organization around or we'll shut it down. And the list goes on. People like uh, Dick Nettle and Andrew Covenant and, and, and uh, Agon Zender. All of these people are individuals that we gathered stories from. But I don't want you to pay attention to their names. Take a look at the list on the right. First, to do something. Restoring profitability. Turning something around. you got two years or we'll close it down. What are those about? No one ever wrote a story, wrote a case, said they did their best as a leader by keeping things the same. <laughs> it wasn't a job of just making things stable. It wasn't a job of, uh, of just you know, doing something ordinary. When we do our best... We write about, we tell about, we talk about times when we face challenge, difficulty, or adversity. Now this is really interesting because our question was not, tell us about a time when you did something difficult. It was, tell us about a time when you did your best. Now of course, all of these were looking backwards and claiming that that was my best, something I did in the past. But people had lots of choices of what they could say was their best. And what they said was their best and now we've collected several thousand of these stories. Was it something difficult to do? Whatever the case, Kathleen Winkle, one of the MBA students who was analyzing this case, not just my observation or Barry's observation, the cases were about staring down uncertainty, staring down, doing something difficult turning something around, meeting a challenge. Any of you seen Randy Pausch's lecture? Uh, last lecture? Randy Pausch, the, uh, the uh, Carnegie Mellon professor at the time, who, uh, if you haven't seen it, by the way, it's a great hour and a few minutes of your time. Go uh, Google the last lecture, uh, and uh, you will find it there posted on YouTube and Carnegie Mellon site. Spend the hour listening to it. Mm -hmm. Randy was asked to give a lecture as he was leaving his, his position as professor at Carnegie Mellon and uh, as he says in the beginning of his talk little did he know that, that uh, the last lecture would in fact be his last lecture because as he told the audience I'm dying of pancreatic cancer he even put the slides of his cancer on the screen And in that lecture, one of the things he said is that the brick walls are there for a reason. They are not there to keep us out. They are there to remind us of how badly we want something. So here are two questions that every leader needs to ask him or herself. What do you want and how badly do you want it? What do you want? And how badly do you want it? It goes back to the question about vision and values. What do you want? And the last question. How badly do you want it? Because one of the things that it turns out, and this is some of the more recent research, and I'm very glad that Angela Duckworth and others are finally engaging in this kind of research, is that what she's finding, whether she's studying grade school kids, men and women at West Point, salespeople, teachers in the classroom, physicians, that there is no successful person who hasn't demonstrated grit. Grit, defined by Duckworth and her colleagues doing this research, is persistence plus passion. A passion for something, what do you want? And the ability to stick with it, how badly do you want it? 
It turns out, and there's more evidence I'll share with you shortly to support this in the arena of learning and development, that suggests nobody will be great unless they, they have at least two things. They really want something, they want to be the best, and secondly, that they are willing to stick with it through the tough times. The message that you, some of you may have heard that you will have 10 or 15 careers in your life. You will be able to, because of all the future opportunities, you'll be going from here to there, to this job, to that job. Guess what? It's a formula for failure, not success. You've been getting bad advice. In fact, the advice that will work for you is find something you really want to do and stick with it. Find something you really want to do and stick with it. If you don't, you, are, you may be good, but you won't be great. Now, of course, you maybe don't want to be great. That's okay. Good is enough. But if you want to be great, if you want to climb Annapurna, if you want to turn around a losing operation, if you want to change the world in any way, you've got to find something you really want to do and stick with it. Passion plus persistence. I highly recommend, if you haven't had the opportunity to read any of Angela's research, she's yet to publish a book on it, but I understand she has one in the works, but she has some academic papers that I think are well worth reading. And it's uh, reinforced by the work of others, and I'll be sharing a little bit of that with you. Trust rules is another of the truths. Uh, this is Bill Flanagan back there at the chalkboard. And it, you, I know you can't see it, but there's a date up there underneath update, April 1984. Uh, I picked this slide for a reason, because it's now 26 years old, just to indicate this is one of the people, Bill Flanagan, that we wrote about in the first edition of the Leadership Challenge, which came out in 87. And this is his personal best. This is a little article in the Amdahl paper. At the, at the time, he was vice president of manufacturing. Uh, and he was director of manufacturing at the time he told us the story. And he's at the chalkboard. And we asked him to tell us his personal best leadership experience, as we had you know, all the other people we were initially interviewing at the time. And, and he said... Uh, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I, 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 can't do, I can't tell you my personal best leadership experience. Barry and I were kind of surprised that he couldn't tell us his personal best because obviously he had done, accomplished quite a lot in his career. So we, we, we asked, we said, Bill, we don't quite understand. Haven't you done something in your career that you would say you were really proud of or that exemplifies you know, the best that you've been able to? He says, oh yeah, I've got, I've got some examples of that. But you see, it wasn't my personal best. It was our personal best. It wasn't me. It was us. No leader ever got anything extraordinary done by him or herself. It takes a team of people to get extraordinary things done in an organization. And what is fundamental to teamwork is trust. And I, I, I picked this slide on purpose. This is from Gigi Zhi, territory manager for BP Petro China Petroleum. 25 years, 20, actually 25 years, 25 years after Bill Flanagan told us his story, Gigi told us hers, and she said almost exactly the same thing that Bill Flanagan did. This is not U.S. specific. This is not about men. It is not about somebody who's older. This is men and women, U.S. and China, all over the world, young and old. The fundamental glue that holds relationships together is trust. All you have to do is ask, uh, oh, Governor Stanford's wife, maybe? <laughs> or John Edwards' wife, maybe? Or Tiger Woods' wife? <laughs> 
You know, I, I really wish I could name a few women on that list, but I'm sorry. I... You know, it's trust that holds relationships together. Trust is the glue. And on the business side, we know the cases of Enron. We know about Madoff. We know about what happened a couple of years ago that, helped, that, that was central to the collapse in the economy and the Great Recession. One can point all the fingers you want at all of the people you want, but fundamentally what happened in social relationships, trust broke down. Trust in individuals and trust in institutions. People no longer trusted their local banker. People didn't trust their investment counselors. People didn't trust the information they were getting. If we're going to recover, we're not going to recover until people start trusting institutions again and start trusting each other again. You'll know when their recovery is around the corner is when people begin to have their trust restored in organizations and institutions and leadership. I don't have data up here from that, that's quantitative, but except for this one slide, it was done in Europe actually, where the results indicate that the majority of respondents trust strangers more than they trust their boss. <laughs> now I want you to think about the implications of this for a minute. Remember we talked about early on credibility as the foundation of leadership? And one of the central elements, in fact, the most important one that counts for the most variance is trustworthiness. So what it means is, if we don't trust, we don't believe in people. And if people are saying, I, I, I'm going to give more credence to somebody who's walking down the street than my boss at work, how effective do you think a manager can be at work? In this country... 37% of people have high to moderate trust in business. You know, you hear on the nightly news how lousy the White House is doing. Well, they're at 48%. Business is at 37 The news media is at 33 The highest trust group, you know what it is? The group that trusted the most? in this country right now? Teachers. Teachers? Well, they'd be in the second most trusted category. <coughs> Mothers. Well, as a prob you know, more than likely as an individual category, but institutions, it's the U.S. military. Yeah. Followed by charitable organizations and education. It's the second most trusted. You want numbers for a on the military? Uh, 60, I'm going to guess 63 to 68%, something like that. I can look it up for you. Actually, you go to Kennedy School uh, at uh, Harvard, and you should probably find it there somewhere if you look hard enough. Tru I think it's called trust and confidence in institutions, something like that. I'll, I'll give you the reference after. So... We have a long way to go to restore that trust in this country and it's it really dependent upon institution. But I also want to point something else out and this may be one of the reasons why the military is at the top of the list. Some of our colleagues at West Point did a study. Pat Sweeney and his colleagues. And they did a, the study of uh, trust in the battlefield. These were in battlefield conditions in Iraq. And they went out to, to soldiers in the field and they asked them to complete survey instruments, assessments, about their commanding officers. So these would be lieutenants and captains. And then they looked at the data and they found something quite interesting. And I, I want you to, to take a look at uh, some highlighted words here. Most importantly, the level of trust that subordinates had in their leaders determined the amount of influence subordinates accepted now this is the military, right? This is the military. In the military you're supposed to salute and do what you're told, right? That's the theory. But in fact what these researchers found was that that wasn't the case at all. People didn't salute and do what they're told unless they trusted their leader. 
The amount of influence subordinates accept is dependent upon the trust they have in their leader. Whether you're talking about commercial business or whether you're talking about the military, the same thing is true. And uh, how do we begin building trust? Well, as leaders, we have to take the first step. The secret to building trust is you trust first. You have to demonstrate trust first before other people will want to return the favor. As leaders, it's our obligation to start the process. And story after story that we have heard from people in the field like Florian Benhold uh, tell the same thing. It really was when my leader demonstrated trust in me, I was then willing to trust him or her. But until leaders demonstrate trust in their direct reports, in their subordinates, in their colleagues, we're going to hold back. We're going to be reticent. The next truth on the list, and I think this is the fifth one, and then we'll stop for some uh, you know, questions and time for some dialogue, is that the best leaders are the best learners. I, I, I selected this one because of the venue, obviously, in, in a learning environment. I just want to reinforce how important it is what you're doing here. Uh, Melissa Poe, now Melissa Poe Hood, was eight years old when she did her personal best leadership experience that we wrote about at the time. This was in the second and third editions of the Leadership Challenge. and She was eight years old at the time and uh, she had listened to a public television program about the environment and uh, what was happening to the environment, particularly about pollution. And she was very concerned that as a young girl, maybe she would grow up where the air wouldn't be breathable. And so she decided at eight years old to do something about it. So what do you do when you're eight years old? Well, you get your family maybe to recycle. You uh, get your friends at school to do the same and you have them convince their parents they ought to get on board. And she started out with those kinds of simple kinds of programs but decided she needed to do something more. So uh, she wrote a letter to the President of the United States, George, the first George Bush at the time, and uh, she wrote him a letter and told the story about how she heard this and how she wanted him to do something about it because he was the President of the United States and if he said that we should do something about it, people would listen because she was only eight years old. He didn't get back to her right away. And she was a little impatient at that age and so she decided to do something about it and so she got a local company to put her letter to the President of the United States on a billboard in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> and she did, well, in Nashville, Tennessee, she thought not enough people are going to notice. So she went to the billboard company and said, could you put billboards in all of the big cities in the United States? And... Uh, he said, well, you know, I, I, I can't do that in all the places, but I have some friends in the industry who maybe could help. So he, uh, he made a few calls and 250 billboards carried Melissa Poe's letter to the President of the United States. Then he got back to her. <laughs> but it was actually too late because she had started Kids Face, Kids for a Clean Environment, which started out with six members at her local grade school. When she left at 18 years old because she wanted to turn it over to a kid to run the organization, she had 2,500 chapters and 300,000 members. They had, by the time she left, planted one million trees as an organization. When we went back to do this, uh, this most recent book. We thought it would be fun to go back to a few people that we talked to before, like Bill Flanagan. And so we, uh, I, I looked for Melissa. I kind of lost touch with her. Found her on uh, LinkedIn. Tried Facebook. Couldn't find her there. Tried Plaxo. Couldn't find her there. Finally found her on LinkedIn. 
wrote her an email, made contact with her. Also found her, you can Google her, Melissa Pohood, and uh, found her also on the web, uh, the web as the recipient of the 2009 American Association of University Women and National Association of Personnel Administrators Women of Distinction Award in 2009 for what she did starting when she was in grade school. And Melissa, in her correspondence with us and in her speech, said, everything you need, everything you need to be successful as a leader, you already have. There is this notion that leadership maybe it's just reserved for a few charismatic men and women, a few individuals who uh, maybe are given something special, but in fact, if you talk to Melissa Post, she would tell you just the opposite, that there's nothing special about her at all. That what she did find was a passion for something, and that what she did do was stick with it. What you need to be successful as a leader, you already have. There's nothing I can give you, nothing Melissa can give you, nothing that any of your faculty members here at the university can give you. Nobody can give you what it takes. You already have it. So how do you develop it? That's the question that we ought to be asking. How do you develop what you already have? What Barry Posner, Lillis Brown and I found in research we did on learning and leadership was that the better learners engaged in the leadership practices more frequently than those who were low on learning, who did not engage in learning activities as frequently as those in the high learning category. The best leaders are the best learners. So it begs the question, which comes first? <laughs> learning or leading? And it's our suspicion that it's learning. That if you have an attitude, a growth mindset, to use Carol Dweck's term, a growth mindset, one that's curious, one that says we're not fixed when we're born, we have the ability to grow and continue to grow our entire lives, you will be more likely to be successful as a leader than somebody who says, well, you either have it or you don't. And uh, there's nothing I can do to be better than I am. It's an excuse for not trying harder, for not engaging in it more. How hard does it have to be? Well, this is Nicholas, my stepson. He's a tennis player, as you can see. He plays uh, number one for UC Davis, men's collegiate tennis, NC2A Division One. So when Nicholas was uh, looking at colleges a few years back, we went around and we talked to coaches. And uh, we wanted to know, you know a little bit more about the coaching practices at various universities. Uh, and uh, so we would always ask, well, tell us a little bit about the routine. One of the people we asked was Glenn Michibata. Glenn Michibata is a coach at Princeton University. And he said, I tell my players that they have to practice at least two hours every day just to stay the same more if they want to get better. Two hours every day just to stay the same more if they want to get better. Now it turns out that while Glenn hadn't read the research, he was quite accurate in his estimation because if you read the research on what's called expertise academic research on expertise how people get to be the best at something you will find that people have to practice a certain number of hours for a certain number of years in order to get to be an impresario at the, you know, be able to perform on the world stage some of you may have read this. What's the number of hours? 10,000 10, hours over how many years? 
Ten years. Ten years. 10,000 hours, 10 years. You can get pretty good 5,000 hours, 5 years, but 10,000 hours, 10 years is what it takes to get to, the, to be the best of the best. That translates into 2.7 hours every day, Monday through Sunday, 7 days a week, for 10 years. And just one more story to drive that number home. We had the opportunity to hear Long Long perform. Any of you ever heard Long Long perform, the Chinese pianist? Absolutely beautiful. So afterwards, there was a little gathering, and we had the, the, the honor of being able to meet him and talk with him. And so, you know, I couldn't resist. I said, so, you know, when did you start playing? And he said, uh, uh, about two years old. Mm-hmm. And I said, so, you know, he hates these questions, by the way. He said, uh, because everybody asked him, you know. So how many hours did you practice? I said, well, I, when I was first learning, I practiced six to eight hours a day. When I turned professional, I only practiced three hours a day. He's a professional, but he practices three hours a day, every day. You want a metric for how much you have to keep on learning every day for the rest of your life? 2.7 hours. I encourage you, all of you, to continue to engage in learning activities for the rest of your life for at least that many hours a day. Whether it's reading, talking to colleagues, watching somebody else who's really exceptional, doing what they do, talking to people who do what you want to be doing, finding out there's some way engaging in continuous learning activities. And the last truth that I will share with you uh, this evening is that leadership is an affair of the heart. You know, it turns out that you really can't do any of this stuff for that many hours a day for that many years if you really don't love it, if you don't have your heart in it. Uh, Pete Thigpen, who was one of the people that we interviewed early on when he was at Levi Strauss and Company, and I happened to, again, we were trying to reconnect with some people that we'd talked to early on, uh, had a cup of coffee with him in, uh, at Pete's Coffee in Berkeley and got reconnected. And, have been talking more about what he's now doing. He's now a senior fellow at Aspen Institute and teaches at Berkeley after retiring as an executive. And he said, you know, really believe in your heart of hearts that as a leader your job is to enlarge the lives of others. That your job is to enlarge the lives of others. And it turns out that the highest scoring leaders on our instrument, but really if you look at other people's research, the highest performing leaders are not that typical rational, cold person that you hear executives have to be. They are actually more caring and more open. They are more affectionate. They are more passionate. They are more positive And they are more grateful and encouraging than lower performers. It's a myth that leaders are the best leaders are cold and rational people. They are more positive and encouraging and upbeat and caring and affectionate than the lower performers. We have been perpetuating a myth about people in executive positions that has allowed themselves to cut their humanity off from the rest of us. We should not allow that to be happening anymore because for one thing, we just don't like working with those people. <laughs> you know, I li- I like to, when I go to work, I like to have somebody around me who's my boss that I like. But also, they're just less effective. Be practical about it. They're not as effective. Why? Because we don't like them. <laughs> you know, oh, I want you to bust my butt. Bust your butt. Bust my butt, too. But bust your butt and perform at your highest levels. Meanwhile, I'm going to treat you like a... You know what? We don't want to be working with those kind of people. You have to have your heart not only in what you do, but in the people you do it with. Claire Owen, who was an individual we have, uh, had her own company in uh, London, England, uh, a uh, re- recruiting company and placement firm. Uh, you know, she talks about how when you're excited about your business, when you're passionate about it, you create a buzz inside your organization and outside your organization. And it's the job of a leader to create that kind of buzz, that kind of energy. Leaders have to be positive. One of the core truths that Barbara Fredrickson, 
uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill has found in her research is that people who uh, are more positive and more open are more creative and higher performers. People who are more positive are people who are more open and more caring and they are more creative. So how positive do you have to be? How positive do you have to be? If one is the negative, what does the positive have to be for people to feel fully engaged, people to feel fully involved in their work? Ten. Ten? One to one. One to one? Five? Three? Two. Okay. The number is three at a minimum. Three at a minimum. That gets you to above having a negative impact on people. Turns out that if you're below essentially 2.4, you're having a negative impact, not a positive impact. You can, eat, you can be a little bit positive. Doesn't, doesn't get you even above average performance. You want to be really positive? You need to be 5.6 to 1 in order to have the highest level of performance among your group. And it can go up to about 12 and then we see diminishing returns. Now this actually was done, this study that Barbara and another of her colleagues did, was actually done mathematically. So these numbers, you come up with 5.641 I think to 1 as a number. So, and by the way, it needs to be more at home than it does at work. And if it's not, the chances that a relationship might split apart is about a 95% probability if it's not at least 5 to 1 at home or in any relationship you know, outside of work. I can tell some of you are doing a little... <laughs> review of your relationships at the moment. Oh, I'll do 25 today to make up for the rest of the week. <laughs> Does it work that way? You know, it's kind of a regular basis. We have to do this. So the, mo- the best leaders have their hearts in their work. And again, just going uh, to where my colleague Barry Posner is right now, down to Australia. Uh, where Judith Wanky is, uh, people appreciate knowing that she cares about them. You know, people just appreciate knowing that we care about them, and they are more likely to perform for us if they know we care about them. Leaders, even though they may, the most famous of them, get their pictures on magazine covers, people write articles about them, if they become so self centered that they show us that they care more about themselves than they care about us. No matter how charismatic they are, no matter how smart they are, we won't want to follow them. Mm-hmm. Leaders need to demonstrate to their constituents that they care about the constituent, not just about themselves. Now, before I tell you the secret to success in life, do we have, yeah, we have about 10 minutes, 10 minutes or so. 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Any of you have any comments, questions, observations? I will tell you the secret to success, but you know, emotional outbursts. Uh, <laughs> I just appreciate yes. it. Well, I appreciate it um, you sharing the story about Bill um, Flanagan because I was sitting up here going, oh, I've got to cross that off my list because that was with a group, you know. So I was having a hard time identifying, you know, that one instance in my life where I was like, yeah, I'm yeah. really proud of that. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, when you think about your personal best, uh, maybe the initial tendency is, well, what did I do? But it's really, it turns out that as we think more about it, it's really about uh, doing it with others. You can't do it alone. Uh, Why don't we talk to Don Bennett, the uh, amputee, was the first amputee to climb Mount Rainier. I always remember this. I asked him, what was the most important lesson you learned climbing that mountain? An individual achievement, right? The first person to do something. He said, you can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. So, it is a, leadership is a team sport. These are all really great traits. So, what gets in the way of people adopting these kinds of qualities? Well, I think we, we have perpetuated a series of myths and misinformation uh, about what leadership is. For one thing, we, you know, we make it out to seem like 
it's, it's an individual effort and it's not an individual effort it really is about teamwork we tell people that you, you can't really learn it it's born or made so we perpetuate that's one reason you, you, you have to follow I mean would you say that like they don't I mean a, a leader should, should be intelligent uh, obviously if they're emotionally intelligent they'll see that their, pe their people their team isn't following them are you, you saying that maybe they're not kind of tuned into that emotional side of leadership uh, it, it's it, it, what the data suggests is that if you had, if you take three three criteria: emotional intelligence, IQ, and experience, related experience, and you rank order them in terms of their importance, how well they correlate with success. Emotional intelligence is on top, followed by experience, and the last on the list is IQ. The last on the list is smarts. In fact, if you have smarts and experience but low I, low EQ, it's a disaster. <laughs> really smart people who know they're smart and smarter than anybody else in the room who have very poor interpersonal skills will destroy a team and destroy an organization because they can't work well with other people and organizations are about working well with other people and so that's another message we, we tend to give leaders this notion that you, you know what one of the things that, that I, I, you know, we're all seeing played out here is what's happening in Washington, right? And it, you, you have these characters or caricatures acted out. So it's, it's like Barack Obama is now supposed to do everything. It's not, Barack Obama is not going to save this country. He can't. It's impossible. He's one person. He has a lot of power. But he can't do it alone. So we, we, even as you listen to the nightly news, we make it seem like one person is going to solve all these problems. Or is to blame if they're not solved. So that's another uh, reason we have... I don't... One of the reasons why we were talking earlier about what... what why do we have these schools? You know, what, what good is the education you're, you're getting? And I think one of the reasons we need more people with your kind of education is to help educate the rest of the world on what really works in this field of leadership and organization behavior, industrial psychology, uh, because it, we, are, we are really undereducated out in the working world about what it takes. Jeannie and I have been doing this for a really long time, and I think you'd probably agree, we haven't made all that much progress. <laughs> so, you got jobs for the future, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> one, one up here and then come up yeah. um, Interestingly, the, the qualities that you talk about here, the caring and the emotional um, orientation, in traditional leadership, lit, lit, those are what characterize as feminine traits. Mm -hmm. So now I see as a, an evolution to what that, what is the triggering social force that has now made all of these caring you know, feminine traits the way to go. Interesting because question. Of aggressive yeah. assertiveness. And yeah. That kind of thing. Well, yeah, we per we perpetuated these myths, and maybe it's maybe it goes back to when we were you know, in the tundra chasing down wild game and things like that. Right? We 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 still haven't evolved that much from that time. Uh, and where you have programs like Survivor and Lost and and you know other other reality shows sort of demonstrate that it, you know only one person is going to win the million dollars. So we, it makes for good TV. It makes for lousy leadership. So we, we are continuing to perpetuate these notions out there. Uh, to, to give you a little bit of, uh, of perspective on the data, however, we find that when you look at men and women on the leadership practices inventory and you compare men to women in terms of how they score, there is only a statistical difference on one of the five practices. The five practices model the way inspire shared vision, enable others stack, encourage to challenge the process. So of those five, which one do you think women score higher on than men do? Model. So model, inspire, challenge, enable, encourage. Encourage, and encourage the heart. But only from their own perspective. Women score themselves higher than men score themselves, but constituents don't score women higher than men, statistically. So, in other words, there isn't, in our, our research, there is no difference. 
between men and women and how they score. What, in other words, the same practices make men and women effective. Mm-hmm. So we stumbled on this model by asking people, tell us about a time when you did your best. Mm-hmm. Men and women just shared the same thing. Then when we quantified it, and compared men and women and people around the world, different backgrounds, different nationalities, and different ages, we didn't find any difference in terms of what works. Mm-hmm. So hopefully uh, we've, we have begun to evolve, but uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Yes, sir. What were your best? Uh, I, the, the, when, I, when I first started doing this research, I... I Barry and I put ourselves through this, and, and, and Jeannie will appreciate this. I wrote about a time when I was the uh, chairperson of the Organization Development Network Conference in 1980 in San Francisco. Do you remember that, day? That, that was my, the best. best <laughs> that was the one I wrote the about. And that was one. Yeah. That was that. So it was actually uh, uh, not uh, related to the job I was doing at the time. It was related to. Uh, 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 an association experience with other OD professionals. It was a lot of fun. I can show you all. I still have all the pictures. <laughs> Jeannie's in it. <laughs> she was part of the, the core group of planners. Uh, first of all, thank you. This is really helpful and I think very relevant to us in, in this school and in terms of where we are, not just in terms of what we teach, but you know things we can take in in terms of our own way of doing things. So, and especially when there's a leadership transition, it's a good chance to to think how we want to do things. Um, related to that, and also the previous question, I'm wondering, in your experience, in terms of you know, how do you actually support people in changing? So, if I hear these, I, I'm in a lecture and I'm hearing these things. Okay, so now I have to think, okay, I need to be more caring, I need to be more positive at home and at work. How, how do I do that for myself? How do I do that for the people I work with, you know, for the people I work for? How do I inspire or move them or lead them to be better leaders? And then finally, if I'm a coach or a consultant, you know, what are some ways that might help in supporting people in developing these, in so, applying these truths? So how do I put this into practice for myself for yourself for individually as a leader bosses and mm-hmm. for uh, people who are my clients you, you remind me of, of uh, one of the people we talked to whose uh, comment said and I was thinking about all this stuff about leadership and values and vision and credibility and all of it seems so overwhelming where do I get started and, 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 and then he said uh, I remembered that every day I have an opportunity to do little things. I could have coached someone better. I could have said thank you more often. I could have been more positive. I could have listened better. I I think that's the answer to the question. It really is about what can I do on a daily basis to listen? What can I do on a daily basis to be more empathetic? What can I do on a daily basis to... uh, demonstrate to other people that uh, they're important. You go down the list and you just make a list of little things. What can I do at home to demonstrate more being more positive? And it's not just about saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. But it's about when they're talking about something that's important to them that you listen to them. That goes on the list of more positive. So if you, if you just go down the list and think of all the little things you might do, all of those little things will add up. Uh, as a coach, uh, good coaching starts with gathering valid and useful information. And so as a coach, I think one of the things armed with this kind of knowledge we can all do is start to collect data about you know, what are these people now doing and how do they compare to what are the best practices so that I can give them feedback that is useful to them so that they can then make a behavioral commitment on what it is that they're going to do with that information. Uh, So it starts with assessment, gathering data, and then giving that feedback to them in a way that's useful and finally putting it into practice. But it's, again, whether it's coaching, consulting, being a good parent, being a good friend, being a, a good colleague, being a good coworker, being a good leader, it's the little steps we can all take. Let me give you just one recommendation for a couple of these things that we we talked about. If you want to think about the challenge dimension, the truth is that challenge is the crucible. It's where it all starts. At the end, 
of the day, every day, ask yourself this question. What did I do today to improve so that I'm better today than I was yesterday? That encompasses the learning, encompasses the challenge, and there are a number of things I could list. Please. Yeah, I'd like to follow up a little bit on your comment about uh, Barack Obama saying that uh, you know people want him to fix everything, and then they want to blame him if everything isn't fixed. Isn't that the way it should be? Uh, the leader is in charge of the team, but the buck stops with the leader. For example, Toyota. Uh, we want Mr. Toyota. To fix Toyota. Take responsibility and for And if he doesn't, you know, it's his fault because he's the leader. I don't like to Certainly, I want Barack Obama to take responsibility for his role in this. I also want all the other people who are on, in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. on Capitol Hill, to take responsibility instead of pointing fingers at each other. So, yes. All leaders have to take responsibility for their part.